Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. Without any waste of time, we're going to start. Those who are going to uh, join us along the way um, will do so. Allow me to welcome our guest today. Um, her name is Mpom Shongo. I will not say much about her bio or her profile. I will allow her to introduce herself because I don't want to say stuff that she, she wouldn't want me to say. Um, we are very honored to have you, Mpo, and thank you so much for availing yourself as a young person to share your views about how issues of social security are supposed to be looked at. Um, I'll ask you to also um, explain more on the topic um, because this is something that we're also looking at making sure that people um, get well informed about. Um, I'm sure more people that are going to join will also enjoy the session. So over to you and thank you so much for having given us an opportunity to engage with you. Thank you so much uh, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, please let me know when you can see it. Um, yes, share. Perfect. I think you should be able to see it. Yes, we can. Yes, uh, perfect. So thank you so much um, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Mpom Songo and uh, how I actually came to be on this platform is that I joined one of the sessions that Antetembi had hosted and I joined in late by must I say I joined in late and when I got in the lady the member of parliament that was speaking was speaking about grants and how unsustainable they are and I obviously had strong opinions about that so I express my opinions and then system be asked that I have a session on social security. So I'm a company secretary intern at SPY. And so most of what I do is very legal based and corporate corporate in, in the corporate governance sector and compliance. But how I came to you know occupying this kind of space is that I the, the institution that I work for is a research institute and we produce a lot of input, new knowledge and information about in the, in the sectors of poverty and inequality. And so when we were hit with the violence that happened in July, we start, we reignited the topic of um, a basic income grant. And obviously that required us to have a look at the history of the, the grants in South Africa and just an overall view of the social security um, system in our country. So I am gonna stop my video and then proceed with the, the presentation. So I will be speaking, and I hope this is more of a discussion and not necessarily a lecture about me and what I do and what my opinions are, but um, yeah, I hope that we can all engage and you know, have a fruitful conversation. Okay, everything is fine. So the idea of this presentation is not to give you a one-sided view of why the basic income grant in South Africa should be implemented. I, I do hope that I give you a whole picture of right when it started and an overview of the, the social security system in the country. So South Africa's social system, uh, as most of us may know, has its origins in the apartheid era. And the whole point of that system in that at that time was to create a welfare state for particularly the, the minority, particularly the white people. And so social security and, and grants for that is, the, it's not a new concept. It's not something that came post 1994. In fact, there was an old age person's grant in around 1928, which excluded obviously um, most black South Africans. In 1937, I believe a disability grant was extended to was extended to, to white people. And in the early 30s and 40s, the social security system was extended to more broadly, including uh, black people. But when we moved from the era of apartheid and into the era of what we call a democracy, 
And obviously 1994 was a very big year in South Africa because this year was the year in which we saw not only the end of apartheid, but we saw a lot of changes politically and constitutionally. However, um, despite these changes, the distribution of income and poverty within society remained similar to, to the time it, during the apartheid. And what we can acknowledge is that our government inherited a, a, syst a fragmented system that is, um, which, had, which still had the interests of white people at heart. A lot of changes had to happen and the new government had to figure out a way of giving effect to the right to social security, which is enshrined in our constitution. And the amount that was initially given to white people could not therefore be you know, applied to black people. It had to make financial sense to adopt uh, a, a new ways of doing things. And so the, the, the grants were extended to black people and so more black, black people received um, grants than before. And currently there are five types of uh, support to families with children below the ages of the age of 14 in, 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 in foster care. And these grants, as we all know, are not unconditional. They are all means tested, for instance, to qualify for the older person's grant, you, your income can't be above a certain amount. And to qualify for a child support grant, the parents oftentimes have to go through a lot of process to, to show that they are deserving and that this amount is necessary for them. For instance, they have to prove that they have sought or exhausted all means to, to find a employment and they have to prove that they are, they, they have to produce certain documents which have not been easy for most of them, particularly in the rural areas, because a lot of people in the rural areas do not have even the basic of having a, an ID document and that hinders the process for many of them. So then what we see is that a lot of people end up becoming excluded from the system, particularly people that are really poor and actually need the, the assistance. So now that we have recognized, we have recognized the success of the grants in, you know, there, there is no, there is no doubt that the grants have actually played a huge role in reducing poverty in South Africa and have prevented millions of people from falling uh, in, from, from hunger, from experiencing hunger. I think it is, it's equally important for us to acknowledge the gaps within the system. Firstly, the means test excludes a large number of people. The requirements prevents the grants from getting even to the poorest households that actually need the grants. Secondly, unemployment rates in South Africa are extremely high. I recently read an article on Bloomberg that South Africa now has the highest unemployment rate, which is bizarre as most of you, I hope, will agree. And lastly, it excludes unemployed, able-bodied persons between the ages of 18 and 59 who actually account for one quarter of those people living in poverty today. And this was also, also acknowledged by the government in the latest Green Paper on Comprehensive Social Security and Retirement Reform. And I would actually urge everyone that if you have time, please actually do read it and go through the documents just so you can get an idea of where government is at with, so, with the grants and the other the reforms that they are suggesting. And one of them actually was a very controversial one is that the government would like to introduce a national social security fund, uh, which would compel everyone to pay a certain amount between eight and 12% of their income into that fund over and above the, the UIF that people are already paying. As if it was not enough, the South Africa, we were hit with, um, the COVID last year, which left thousands, if maybe, if not millions without jobs and making it very hard for them to make ends meet. And so we were set with the new, with the new set of challenges and to, to mitigate the impact of COVID-19, um, the government implemented a relief grant of 350, which was at first widely welcomed. And I mean, it was accepted and welcomed as it marked the first time also that unemployed adults of working age were included in the social grant system. The grant was initially supposed to last for, for six months, I believe, but 
it was extended and then it was halted again this year. And now it has been brought back, um, which is a huge victory. And But then the biggest problem is that this grant was the access to, to this grant. It was very limited because of the, the extremely strict, the, the qualifying cri criteria, it was extremely strict and neat. And, you know, when, and also as if things were not becoming worse. And I feel like we were in a, a worse situation and every time something happened, it put us these steps backwards. And I mean, in when in July, we experienced the worst form of violence and terrible scenes emanated from Kezad and Harding, many businesses and livelihoods, livelihoods were, were destroyed. And while we receive the extension of the grants as civil society, we are, we still maintain that the 350 should not be stopped. In fact, they should be a stepping stone uh, for a, a BIG, which is what I'm gonna come to now. And coming to, this is by far the most contentious part of what has been happening over the last two years. And, you know, the debates about whether or not a basic income grant should be implemented in South Africa has been underway for over 20 years, actually, um, when the initial concept was investigated in 2002, and a Taylor report has been since published for that. And so it's not it's not a new concept, um, but the topic obviously was reignited last year with the the emergence of the coronavirus. And from 2002 until now, different models and proposals have been developed of how this system can work, and if whether or not it's it's necessary if we need it. But what should be borne in mind is that a BIG, if it is implemented, it shouldn't be seen as a a silver bullet, or it shouldn't be seen as, as, as a tool that can solve all our economic problems in South Africa, but should be seen as a step in the right direction of transforming the whole, the whole economy. So back to the basics, before we get into the nitty gritties of what, you know, whether or not we can afford a, a basic income grant, which has been a uh, point of contention for many people um, is that let's start by defining what a basic income grant is. And a basic income grant, I will use this definition, is a periodic cash transfer that is unconditional and permanent and is paid to all individuals in society. And others have defined a basic income grant as a guarantee. So the G and the BIG, some have gone to, have labeled it as a, a guarantee. And the reason for this is due to the negative connotation attached to the word grant. A lot of people, you know, have described it as a handout or as some form of a handout, which is obviously seen in negative light for some people. But then the word guarantee, on the other hand, speaks to the assurance that the government, you know, can actually provide this, this amount, whatever amount, because people have, have put out different amounts, but can provide an amount to every person, you know, or provide an income to every person in order for them to survive. But despite the differences in names, whether you call it a grant or a guarantee, it does not change the, the core of a basic income grant. Um, the driving force be behind the push for an implementation of the background is that the income would the income would allow, and I will get to the amount shortly, but the amount will allow millions of people to meet their basic needs. And this is extremely important in the South African context where unemployment is very high, as, as I've already mentioned, and poverty is just as high. And so I've Given the elements, the elements of a BIG are what appears on your screen right now is that a BIG is a cash payment made on a monthly basis that universally applies to all persons between the ages of 18 and 59. So the periodic is that the month would be paid on a on a once-off basis and not on a on I mean not a, on a monthly basis and not on a once-off basis. And the amount would be paid to 
the amount would be individually targeted. So it wouldn't be paid to an, a household, for instance, it would be paid to every person, every qualifying person in the household. So if, for instance, uh, uh, the amount is 1,000 rand and there are six people in the household, it would be 6,000 rand and not 1,000 rand to accommodate everyone. And this, again, is to say it's going to allow people to meet their basic needs. So it's not a huge amount that we are calling for, but it's an amount that has been determined to say, this is how much you know, it will cost you to buy a basket full of basic food that you will need in order to sustain yourself. And the, the part is that it's paid to all without a means test. Now, this is different from the, the grants that we currently have, which are means tested. And, you know, there are many conditions that you have to meet in order to receive or to be eligible to receive that amount. And this was also seen with the, the, the COVID grant where the requirements were, ex the list was endless. It was a lot. And for some of them, it was a bit, it would raise an eyebrow. For instance, the one about you not being able to receive, you know, an SDR grant because you are a recipient of NSFAS. That for me, it did not make sense because by virtue of being a recipient of an NSFAS is that you are not in a financial position to provide for yourself. So why are you being excluded from this system when you are already in a system to show that you can't, you can't afford? But, and yeah, okay, next slide. So as mentioned in the previous slides, various models have been developed and these models speak to how the, the basic income grants should be implemented. Some have called for a phased in approach, for instance, so dividing it into different stages while some of us have called for a staged you know, approach based on your age and, and so forth. But the prevalent model calls, currently calls for a basic income grant of 1,268. And this amount is, it's been a point of contestation before I get to, okay, so the amount is based on the upper bound poverty line, but it has posed a lot of, a lot of issues. I mean, the various meetings, the civil society organization meetings, we had different amounts, you know. On one hand, others are calling for a BIG of this amount of the 1,268, but on the other hand, people were calling for uh, an amount of 1,005. So the, the 1,268 is based on the upper poverty line as mentioned, but the 1,005, for instance, it seemed to, it's obviously set at an amount above the upper bound poverty line, and the, um, the justification for it was that it amounts to 50 rand a day, which they believe is enough to provide, you know, to, to survive on that day. If, if we're looking at, you know, like for food and just for sustainability for the day, I guess. And another point of contestation among civil society organizations has been how the amount, who should receive the amount. I heard there was a meeting that I attended and the, one of the speakers said that unemployed graduates, for instance, should receive more than any other young unemployed person. And whilst the pool of recipients is limited, that you, it has to be people between the ages of 18 and 59 through targeting, I don't think it's worthwhile for us to, you know, divide people that are already in a very difficult, you know, financial position by virtue of, you know, not having enough money, by virtue of being unemployed and able-bodied, whether or not you're a graduate, the amount should be the same. And this will also help in the administrative process to say, we are taking out one amount to these people, we have identified these people. And so having to divide it, I, I think will cause more problems. And, you know, given the large pool of targeting, we obviously need, we need money, we need funds to make this, this process or the make the grant a success. And this has given rise to the questions of, can we afford it? Um, today, I was actually in a, we we're shooting the first episode of the big debate. And the biggest question was, 
can we afford it? And members of the public were invited to say, to give their opinions and just share their experiences and whether or not they feel that the basic income grant should be implemented. And for most of them, the question, most of them, the people that said, no, it shouldn't be, it was based on the fact that we can't afford it. And obviously this is based on what the government has been telling us that we don't have money, we can't keep, you know, we, we, we can't, you know, make, we can't, we can't spend more than what we already are. That will put us in a very, um, in a very bad situation. But economists and people that have conducted research, you know, to to look into the financial sustainability of a basic income grant and whether or not it's affordable, have come out and said, okay, we have produced research, and we have come up with, you know, a number of ways that the basic income grant can be funded. And on your screen right now, it's 11 ways that Udu Makubule, he's an economist, he has identified these as some of the ways in which, you know, the, 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 the BIG can, can, be, can be financed. And this list is, is by no means exhaustive. So there are many other ways that other people have suggested, but the biggest primary, the biggest source of you know, the funding for a basic income grant has been identified to be taxes. Um, not necessarily income tax, which a lot of people have, you know, said or thought to be the where the, the government is going to, to recoup that money or get that money from. But there's, there's different kinds of tax that's, that have been identified, particularly, for instance, the wealth tax. Um, there, there has been mentioned of you know, making companies or companies that are not compliant, are compliant with, for instance, environmental laws should be taxed more as a way of, you know, not necessarily punishing them, but to curb the, the ease at which some companies have, you know, destroyed the environment or gone against the rules. But these are some of the ways that have been identified. And excuse me, but the, the biggest question for me is that, you know, particularly I want to speak more about the wealth tax. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not an economist, uh, but I do have a bit of understanding of how wealthy people operate and I think we all do but the truth is wealthy people do not spend a great part of their wealth productively and you know we see this through investment and offshore accounts and and reserves and all of those things so I can appreciate the you know the concerns about you know, taxing wealthy people that they're going to leave the country and they're not going to invest more and that you know we can't afford we can't afford to have the rich of the richest people leave the country and not invest. But what is what happens if I mean that is not the only the only way, by the way, of, of financing, but it's just been identified as one of the ways. And obviously the fact that we can't really or having to investigate how much wealth someone really has is a very difficult process because it's not a some of the information is not publicly available. So that might take time. And that is why they have identified other ways to say we can have, you know, UIF surpluses, um, you can increase borrowing. And yes, I, I know we're already in debt, but there are other ways that we can finance um, a BIG. And what is interesting also is that there's a misconception, there's a running misconception that by providing a grant, you are taking out money out of the system, but then not realizing that by giving people money, thereby increasing their spending, their buying power, therefore participating in the economy and the market, the government will be able to recoup the money. For instance, for every one rand spent, the government will be able to receive at least two rands back. So we can eventually get to a point where the system is paying for itself through, you know, the, the surpluses, the the profits, and and every other ways. And it's just a matter of restructuring the systems that we already have in place, reduce 
you know, spending, reduce corruption, we can move things around to find, you know, we, it's not a stagnant economy. It can't, money can be moved around if we just a matter of, it's just a matter of priority, priorities, excuse me. But with that considered and in light of the current state of the economy and other social ills, which are made worse by unemployment, poverty, and you know, COVID now is that the big question should be, can we afford not to implement a basic income grant? So arguments have been made. Um, I want to start with the four. So arguments have been made both you know, against and some have argued for to say, this is why we need to be a, a, a basic income grant, or this is why we don't need a basic income grant. But just to reiterate the fact that a basic income grant is not a new phenomenon. Over the years, a number of pilots have been conducted, you know, both in developing and, and developed countries. And, you know, most of them are conducted with the aim of seeing whether or not a BIG, you know, has the potential to change the lives of people or whether it's affordable. And from those pilots, some of the stuff, these, what you have, what you see on the screen are some of what has been identified to be, you know, the changes that really, that were most notable. For instance, self-employment, it was reported that some, and, you know, more and more people found ways to make more income from what they were already receiving. And we, in the South African context, we saw this with the 350s, that some people were able to start, you know, baking businesses, some people were selling amakuinya, some people bought sewing machines so that they could, you know, make dresses or, or, or something. Some, some people started, you know, put ice cream machines to make ice creams. And so it's, for me, that was the biggest one because in a country where, you know, a lot of young people are unemployed, in a country where we have a lot of talent, young people are extremely talented. And the biggest problem is that they do not have funds. The SMMEs are not enough and, you know, not this, I mean, it's past, sorry, but like there aren't many structures that, you know, incubate young business people, that incubate entrepreneurs to, to provide with support, not just financial, but when, if people can be able to receive, for instance, the 1,268, they can do a lot more for themselves. And hopefully in the, in, the, in the long term, they can be able to grow their businesses and, you know, be able to employ other people. And another thing for me was what I noticed in some of the reports from the pilots that were conducted is that financial, the financial dependence, the financial dependence that was, you know, independence that was fostered by, that would be fostered, the financial dependence that was fostered by the basic income grant. And, you know, as women were empowered, you know, through self through increased self-employment activities. And this also translated into, you know, sexual freedom in some instances where women were faced with the pressure to engage in transactional sex in order to make ends meet daily. And this obviously carries a significance for it's, it, we can apply it to home. You know, we, we know that 12.1% of, you know, the countries are dollars and girls and, and young women between the ages of 15 and 24 are reported to having ever engaged in, in, in transactional sex to, to make ends meet. And this breaks my heart because just speaking about it now, it takes me to the reports that we read, you know, I think two weeks back that over 23,000 girls between the ages of 10 and, and 19 um, gave birth last year. And I mean, we don't know for sure what or who fathered these girls. So we don't know the, the, the circumstances around that, but that number is extremely high. And we, we know, we all know of someone who, or people or stories, we've heard stories of people having to put themselves in very dangerous situations, precarious situations, just so they can get the money. With students, I heard of stories of, you know, my colleagues in school who had to, do other stuff to, you know, to be able to survive. And yeah, that's a, that's a very um, sensitive topic, but, you know, the reduction in poverty and, you know, is quite closely linked to people's buying power and in return an increase in GDP. 
I mean, the truth of the matter is a country where in money is not spent, it's not sustainable as businesses may be forced to shut down and thereby leading to unemployment. We can't keep having businesses open when people can't buy. And I've heard arguments saying that we don't need a grant, we need jobs. But then the question is, you have a job or if you're creating your own employment or you have your, your side hustle, as some people might call it, who is going to support you when people don't have money? And you know, the nice thing that and I wish more people could understand is that a certain level of the funds or a certain amount of the funds will be recouped, you know, from increased spending by grant recipients through, for instance, VAT. Um, yes. And then there are the arguments, mostly the arguments against a basic income grant is that it's unaffordable. And I've already presented a, a slide where in, you know, Uduma has identified 11 ways and this list can go on, but he has identified so many ways that the basic income grant can be funded. Again, it's just a matter of using what we already have and restructuring, reprioritizing what we already have. Reduce where it's not necessary. If you're spending more than you need to, reduce it. And, you know, we can find a way. I'm not, this is not to say, you know, it's, it's going to work. But if you are, if you have decided that you're not going to do it, I mean, we have met with a lot of backlash from Treasury. Every time we attempt to speak to them, it's just like, we can't. And it's just like, okay, you can't. And you, you're saying you can't, but what are you basing it on? And if you're not willing to hear what people have said, if you're not willing to try it, let's try pilots, try it out. I mean, we saw with the SDR grants where, they were stopped and the minister at that time said, sorry, we, we can't, we just don't have money. We, we're not extending it. And he said it unapologetically, but then, you know, a few months down the line, we are told that it's been brought back. So it's like the same way you were able to make provision for that, we, we believe that you can make provision for a basic income grant. And all you have to do is just hear us out. And another argument against the BIG is that it will create dependency and that you know people will stop looking for employment and people will become lazy but the truth is who can stop 1268 rand cannot stop anyone from looking for work and there's no empirical data to show that this is what has happened yes people are saying this because you know you've seen a Emma Bule from, you know, down the street, every time she receives the child support grant, the first thing she does instead of providing for the kids is to go do her hair, is to do her lashes, is to do her nails, you know, you know, invest in how she looks more than, you know, providing for the kids. And, you know, that people are going to become lazy, people are going to stop looking for work. Personally, I don't believe that um, because there is no data that suggests that that has happened. And in fact, in the pilots that have been conducted in the other countries is that people were encouraged to look for more work. People were encouraged to increase the amount that they received, you know, through participating in local markets. I'm a stock failure, investing, doing everything you can to make that money more. 1,268 cannot possibly make anyone sit back. It's not an amount that I think you can be comfortable with, but yes, I may be wrong. And we, I hope we can talk about this in, you know, when, when people have, when we have questions, but, and this is the last slide, the last slide I, yeah, this is the last slide. But now the question is, we have seen, um, we have seen and we have heard of stories, people struggling and needing help. And for me, why this matter is extremely sensitive or why it's so close to me or why I'm even interested into turning, you know, a basic income grant into just an idea and into reality is that this, everyone has the right to social security. And this is provided for in our constitution, which has been lauded as being the most progressive constitution in the world. So yes, it's an ideal, but if it's in the constitution, it tells me that when the constitution was drafted, you had intentions of making better. You had intentions of providing for people that cannot provide for themselves. And the constitution says that is that 
people have the right. And if someone cannot provide for themselves, the government should step up and, you know, provide. Obviously, within um, available resources and and money. So, and if money is available, and we do believe that money is available because we have seen how the government acts. We have seen what has happened. We have read reports that, you know, there's still an amount. We see corruption happening every single day. So if there wasn't money, how would all of that be possible? But, you know, I think now is the time for, for the government to really step up and heed to the cause of the people and see the plight of many people. People are starving. And, you know, with, with the statistics, stats, stats have a tendency of making things, it's, it's palatable. You can, you, can, you can see, okay, it's 31%. Poverty, it's not that much, you know, if you compare it to, you know, the rest. But on the ground, people are struggling to make ends meet. And we saw this with, you know, we heard with the, how people felt that the 350 was not enough and that it should be extended. So, again, a, a basic income grant, it's not going to solve all problems but we i do believe that it is a step in the right direction and it is something that the government should actually consider they spoke about in their green paper they have made commitments to the un to say yes we will consider it and so now i think it's time to actually do it and give people an amount that is going to have that will allow them to lead a decent standard of living um, Yes, so I, I think if there are questions, um, we can you know have this discussion, and I'd really appreciate it if you know people share their opinions and if they felt whether or not you know basic income grant is necessary, if we need it, if it's affordable. But thank you for listening to me. I hope I wasn't too long. Thank you so very much. Um, Wow, <laughs> this is uh, very mind uh, blowing. And I think it's quite challenging. At the same time, it is something that we have to talk about. I'm one of those who are against. <laughs> I'm one of those who are against and I'm not gonna talk too much in order to allow everybody to participate. Um, to all the participants, those who join us late, uh, you'll watch the presentation in full on our YouTube channel. Um, but for now, we're requesting you to um, pose comments, raise questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually <laughs> taken aback. Uh, that was a very great presentation. Uh, we'll take hands now. You can, I'm recognizing you, Shadrach. Anybody else? Okay, well, myself, then, as well, myself as well, I am unable to locate the, the icon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, we recognize you. Um, okay, we'll start with you because you said you would want to leave. Um, and then Shadrach, will, you'll follow. Over to you. Yes. Thank you so much, Temegile, uh, and thank you so much again for the presentation. It's, it's very thought-provoking. Thought but then at the same time, I would, I would agree with the, the sentiment of the continuation of the 350 relief grant, um, especially that there is nothing for the ages between 18 and 59, they have been excluded within the system. Unless if a person is disabled, then the person will be able to get disability grant. Otherwise, uh, these are the people that are being affected. The only challenge is the, the strict qualifying conditions of the 350. Mm -hmm. Then one would then suggest that um, the BIG could be fast track. I, I also agree with you, as you're saying, when you said that it's a step in the right direction, especially that the conditions are so relaxed, uh, it's permanent, it, it doesn't have a means test. Mm -hmm. So the only challenge with BIG is the way 
to finance it. One wouldn't want a situation where the government would start robbing Peter to pay Paul. And the, the level of corruption within South Africa really is, is, is we are not sure if, if really the, the BIG will be able to touch the people it is meant for due to the level of corruption in South Africa. But otherwise we, we really appreciate the, this thought provoking presentation. And those are my comments, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think one of the of the interesting things that Mpo said was, hey, my video is acting up. One of the interesting things that she said was, reduction of poverty will actually give people a buying power. And at the same time, she also said, if we encourage the side hustle approach, who is going to buy? you are saying government should not rob Peter to pay Paul. <laughs> I think we need to find a way in which we are able to, because my view is that as much as we'd want people to be given this BIG, um, to what extent would we capacitate them to be able to do things on their own? I watched yesterday, um, the street vendors complaining in front of, uh, was it Twane municipality? I think so. And they were sleeping there and crying. They're expected to pay 250 for just selling on the street. And also there's also some, some uh, fee that they have to pay on a monthly basis of 300 and something. So in a nutshell, they end up spending 300 and, or 500 and something just to be selling on the street. But at the same time, they are saying there is no one to sell to because people are not coming to work, they are at home. Are we saying now with this, I just want you to think about it as you will be responding to all these questions. Are we saying now that by giving people the BIG, um, that will, to a certain extent, make them be able to start businesses, like you said? Who's going to buy still because people are working from home? Maybe it's just for temporary purposes. To what extent are we going to continue giving them the money without capacitating them to be able to do things for themselves? It doesn't have to be selling. It can be other businesses that can um, that can assist in you know improving the environment, um, which does not require somebody to sell. I just feel that we, we would be giving people money. Um, not really making them work for it. And that's why they end up doing nails and all these kind of things. Shadrach, over to you before she responds. Um, I just wanted to put that view uh, so that she can also take it into consideration. Um, thanks a lot, Chair. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Ms. Ntlongo, for such a thought provoking presentation. Um, Quite honestly, in I'm, op I'm opposed to giving BIG to anyone below the age of 45. Um, might, at, I mean, at, at first glance, it might sound a bit better, but uh, I think there are other modalities that can be employed to deal with the scourge of unemployment in our country. It is a fact that most of our youth are unemployed. But I want to get your view on the proposal or proposition that uh, instead of giving, okay, we haven't arrived at the actual amount um, that should be paid to any other person who qualify for BIG. But how about a proposal where instead of giving a person that 1,5, you give that 1,5, you subsidize a business to hire such a young person, gain experience, 
so that it will be easier for that particular person to be employed after maybe a year or so, other than to give a person a grant for life without uh, accumulating any experience that will alleviate um, the burden of government looking after that person. You see, in as much as your contention is there is no empirical evidence that the grants make people lazy, I've taken note of that. But is there any empirical evidence to the contrary that when people are given uh, grants, actually it motivates them more to look for gainful employment uh, within the economy? Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, over to you, Mpo. Thank you. Um, I just had to turn off my camera because I think you could see me typing the questions. Um, but to answer the first, the first question um, that, you know, there's no certainty that it's going to reach, well, it wasn't a question, it was a comment, that it's not going to reach everyone who needs it. And obviously financing is a problem. I acknowledge that, uh, but I think, you know, once we get the idea out of our minds that a grant is a handout and that people are going to become lazy, then we can start having a conversation, a constructive conversation about, okay, we are all in agreement. We are all, we all see the need for this grant and that the need is right now. Then we can start talking about the financing options to say, okay, we don't want to, you know, if we don't use tax or if we don't increase wealth tax, um, how else can we finance the basic income grant? And this is when you know we look at other ways that other people have used, other countries have used. A pilot in Namibia was done. I think the situation of Namibia is very similar to ours in South Africa. So there are a lot of lessons that we can draw from them. And you know. Not, and adding to, to, to your question, Sustainable, to say how instead of why don't we create, you know, a job, like jobs for people or make people work basically to receive this amount. Sorry about that. To make people work to receive this amount. And my, my response is, why can't we do both? Why can't we do jobs or why can't we compel government to give people jobs as they have promised for years? while also providing a grant. I mean, with them, what needs to be done in terms of the jobs is that, you know, they're not gonna come tomorrow. They're not gonna come next year, but the government needs to create an environment that will allow people to look for jobs. If you, the government creates jobs, how am I expected to get data to, you know, to apply for those jobs? How am I expected to travel to those sites of interview? How can I move around? And this is when the arguments from you know the reports have said that people have been able to do a basic thing such as catching a taxi you know if you are and obviously this is not not to use this term, but if in your family you are in a financial position where people can call you to say we don't have food or you know we need transport money or we need money to get a taxi for anything why is it so difficult to then imagine a situation where we move that responsibility to the government as the government to say, we have a constitution and you have a duty to promote, to, to provide for those rights and you know, to encourage people. I mean, the duties will obviously come with responsibilities, but you have the duty to realize these rights. And if a right exists, then why is it so difficult or why is it so so why is it difficult to imagine a situation where the government actively works towards, you know, realizing those jobs? Those, those rights. So I think, um, can you hear me? Um, I seem to be having issues with my, sound yes i do okay okay thank you so the jobs and basic income grants they can exist in the same you know in the same world and i think what is important what we need to do is that we need to 
avoid a situation where we make poor people slaves or we make poor people, we treat poor people like slaves. We don't have to prove that you have, you know, gone through pillar A to B or to Z. Show us that you have made an effort to find a job. Show us that you deserve this amount. By virtue of someone not having a job, by virtue of someone going to bed hungry, by virtue of millions of kids or many kids, thousands of kids probably not being able to go to school because parents cannot afford to, to pay for school fees. That is very telling. And we are dealing with the situation now where it's almost as if we have to, we don't have to take government to court to, you know, to compel them to do their duties. It's something that they should be doing. If you can provide for grants, you can provide for this. And you have made that commitment as government to say, yes, you made it to the UN committee to say, yes, we, we acknowledge the gap. We, we will work towards it. You have released a green paper to say, we, have, we are looking into it and we think this is how they, it can be financed. For them, they said that in the green paper, they said that a 10.2% increase, in, 10 increase in, in income tax, it may seem significant, but you know, it will, the benefits far outweigh um, the, the, the amount. So I think, Sissemi, just to get back to your point that the, you, we have no guarantee of how people are going to use this money. We, we can't say for sure that you know, everyone will use it to buy food. We can't say for sure that everyone will use it to start a business. We can't say for sure that everyone will use or some, some of that money will be used to, you know, making the education better for their kids or the experience of going to school better for their kids. But what we are dealing with right now is that people need money. And if someone needs money, why do we have to put them through so much to show that they deserve this money? if a money is available or finances or means are available to give these people, and it's not a handout, it comes with the realization that it's an investment. We are investing in people to say, we can't continue as a country like this because businesses are open, people are not buying. Yes, people are working remotely, but if you have, you know, you have a hundred grants to spare, you can go to a spaza and buy bread. But if you don't have that hundred grants and you're at home, you're working, Who's going to buy that bread? I'm not speaking about big corporates that are, you know, multinational and have stores everywhere, like your pick and pays, your shop rights, and the likes. But I'm speaking about these paths that down the road. The people that were protesting outside the offices to say, you guys are asking us for money that we don't have. People are not buying. You know, where do we get this money? So it's when we see it more as an investment and not a handout. I <clears throat> excuse me, I think then we can start having a conversation to, to make everyone understand, uh, to make, to get everyone on board. And the amount has not, not been decided yet. Um, government is speaking about, you know, the food poverty line, which is 585. Others are calling for 1.5. Others are calling for 1.2. So it's not decided yet. And I understand what you're saying, um, Mr. Nkuna, to say that, you know, you would be more open to the basic income grant if it was given to people above the ages of 45. That is one, there are models that have suggested that to say, no, we, we don't want to you know, start with everyone. Let's start with the people between the ages of 59 and you know, 59 and 55, which I understand the reasons are, are valid and then you work your way down and you work your way down. Or some others have said, instead of giving the full amount, let's start with 585 at the food poverty line. And then maybe after some three years, we move to this level. And after some years, we move to this level. And subsidizing and saying, I am going to give you this money on condition that you do this is exactly what we're running away from because then what that ends up doing is that it excludes a lot of the people that need it. If you're gonna put measures in place to say, well, you have to start a business. Not everyone wants to start a business. Someone wants to upskill themselves. Someone wants to go to tertiary and you know, pay a thousand rands or 500 rands for tuition, just so they can upgrade a metric consult job so they can increase their chances of getting a better job. So it's, I'm looking at it from that lens to say, 
I don't know what they're going to do with this money, but I'm hoping that this group of people, at least we will see a reduction in poverty, we'll see an increase in buying power, we'll see an increase in the GDP of the country, and therefore the country can, the economy can, you know, everyone, everyone is working, everyone can, can pay, they're all going to pay the VAT, if you go to pick and pay, you're going to pay VAT, so the money will end up going back, it's going to be a cycle, and hopefully we can get to a point where the BIG can finance itself without the government having to, you know, dig in their pockets or move things around or, you know, borrowing, which is probably the most extreme, but it's not impossible. So the evidence from the pilots that were conducted to say, actually there was an increase in, you know, people upskilling themselves. There was an increase in school attendances. There was an increase in, you know, women empowering themselves. There was a decrease in transactional sex. I think for us, we can take that as a first step to say, okay, this has been done in this country. Yes, they're not the same. We're not dealing with the same dynamics, but it doesn't hurt to try. It doesn't hurt to see how we can work through this. It doesn't, it's all about trying and we can have a pilot, we can, you know, a sample size and see how that works and then take those results and put them, but nothing right now, nothing has been done, which then makes it very difficult to sympathize with the government to say, okay, we see you're trying because they haven't tried. And, you know, with the, the 350s, it was a huge success because as I mentioned, it was the first time that people between the ages of 59, 18 and 59 were included in any system if they were able-bodied. So yeah, I, I hope I have answered those questions and, you know, yeah, but I'm, I'm open to more questions. Yeah, it's not only your responsibility to get the, the answers. I think collectively we're supposed to find a way in which we can be able to get the answers. That's why we have this kind of engagements and we appreciate the fact that you came with the thought because it will actually allow people to think outside of looking at the grant as a handout, like you said, um, as an investment. I'm also still struggling to find out how but I think it is yes possible for it to be looked at as a as a as an investment. We just have to educate people. I don't think as black people we have been taught much to manage our money and to use our money in a manner that is going to be profitable for us. We we waste much more than use it for profit. So if you have 500 rand, most of the people will use it for luxurious stuff. No, I haven't had cool drink in a long time. Let me just thank myself. <laughs> and that uh, thanking yourself is actually taking money to something that is not going to benefit you, whereas it's going back into the government in terms of that. So I think there's a need for a huge um, money management uh, kind of a skill that people would have to be taught. And yeah, the dependency part, I still feel we can do much more. Um, I'll take hands now. Uh, Actually, it's Mr. Macheta first, and then then Noctula, and then Mr. and then Tebojo, uh, in that order. No, uh, Mr. Macheta, Noctula, and then Tebojo. Over to you. Hello. Yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you. Okay, no, thank, thanks very much for the platform, TMB, and the presenter, um, Paul. You know, I, I must agree that I am in a complete uh, disequilibrium. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I, I don't totally agree with the BIG, but uh, I think Paul is bringing something here a disequilibrium, as I'm saying, and in science they say, before you, you reach equilibrium, perhaps you must go through disorder or entropy. But my thinking is that uh, perhaps for a start, uh, instead of giving it as it is, because there are so many questions, in, particularly in South Africa, you spoke about the street vendors in Pretoria, um, whether will they also qualify because of the, the amount of income they get. There are so many people like the, the handyman, the people who come to, to fix your, your lives, the people who come to fix 
on, on, on part-time basis. Maybe they are not registered even at UIF and they are earning a particular income, but because they are not registered anywhere, they can simply say no. Then because of that, I, I can uh, register to get that, that BIG. I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking, you know, it's why I'm, I'm also thinking about the, some of the taxi drivers, they might not be registered as, an, as employed people. So what is it that we are going to do to, to legitimize the applicants? I know the SASA has got the, the issue of a means test, but uh, if you don't have, perhaps you are not registered anywhere as, as a, any, anything, how are we going to do that? But my thinking, yeah, besides raising so many questions and the doubts, but uh, the, the positive side, of course, is if majority of people do have an income, we will have a, a closer to societal uh, stability and peace. And, and, and the more we have this uh, income difference as it is in South Africa, that's why we have so much instability and, 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 and even crime. Sometimes we don't want to justify it, but what we saw in July, these are some of the, the remnants of it. But the other issue that I'm, I'm just thinking aloud, Paul will correct me or agree with me that, like we are doing with the EPWP extended public works program. If these people, I think Tim, you spoke about it a bit. If we have them, all of them, instead of just get, getting it for free, they end it in, in a way. There are so many programs of government that are collapsing. For instance, I'm I'm, I'm, a, I'm an environmental lover activist. The way the environment is so damaged, can we perhaps say they work a minimum number of hours or number of days in a month to ensure that they end it? And basically cleaning the environment, if you go to, I mean, in towns, even in rural areas, the environment is littered everywhere. If, if we can have those people, uh, to earn that money, but uh, in a way, they also contribute towards cleaning the environment. Will, will we not go somewhere else? Perhaps we can reach the the, 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 the ideas like, like Rwanda now is one of the, the cleanest uh, country in the world because they do voluntarily cleaning uh, the environment. I think it's monthly or weekly, but somebody has said they are, they are doing that. That's why Rwanda is, is, is one of the cleanest. So, but yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm just saying, instead of ending it for free, can we, we think of, of other things? So in short, let me stop there. Other colleagues might uh, come with other suggestions and or ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Noctula. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm audible enough. Yes, you are. Uh, thank you so much for with the presentation and coming from a, a young person, I can see that you explore your mind on this issue and it's something that shows it in your heart. But then again, my comments are just on the issues because here, yeah, and like Ms. Makubela was mentioning that are we transforming or are we trying to create a, a, a society that will depend on government for ends meet every time. And I'm glad that you have changed um, when you were responding in terms of age that maybe we can start with, the pilot can start at the age of 59 going down. Because with the issue of social grant, my view it's always like it has made people, we can run away for the fact, but it has made people to depend on government. In, in terms, even if the boy or the father of the child is affording, but the first thing they give that they go to register the child, they get a certificate and they go and register for a social grant and giving birth to many children and you know there is a grant. We are coming from a situation as a country where people, there was a time, even though I cannot say I have but it was on media at some point where people will even look for speed of people who are 
uh, HIV positive, so that they will be positive in order to get the grant. And such issues, someone prefer to be sick just to be getting something from government. So my view will be, there are many ways that we can do because even if you are mentioning people from the age of 18 and upwards who can be getting this basic grant. And if we are saying this basic grant, like the other speaker mentioned, you rob Peter to pay Paul. Now, does it mean if I'm on this basic grant of let's say 1.2, and I'm also a mother of three who's getting a social grant, or I'm the person that is fostering a child. And then now, like you mentioned, the issue of each one in the household should get this amount. We cannot run to the fact because, like you said, there were no facts that are showing, but it's something as we are sisters in the location, we always see what is happening with this money of grant. A family member was taking care of the social grant of a child, but the child was not benefiting for that from that amount because the Sasa card was left with the Mashonisa men. So I had to go and intervene and cancel that grant. So there are so many issues that makes people instead of taking the responsibility. So if we are to transform, we can try this, but I see a slim chance of government succeeding in a place where, because some people are not even honest. Like pre previously I did mention, I think it was Dr. Sitole was giving a, a, a presentation. And I've said that in terms of people making sure so that they are depending on this grant, even someone who is earning a salary, like a government employee we have seen on those social, on those uh, grant from 350, people are abusing the system as well. So if we are to transform a society, not to depend on grant, really we have to think about different ap approach than introduction of the basic income because they will be dependent on that. Because like, for example, patients who are on TP treatment, sometimes they will default because there is that part when you are on TP treatment and you are not working, you receive the full uh, social grant like for an older person. So you are eligible to get that from maybe uh, six to 12 months. So some people, again, they want to default with the medication. So our government, we are going backwards and forward with people because normally this thing of social grant as a whole is making people to dependent on government. So that's what I want to say to you. Thank you. Let's take the word before uh, we come back to Mpo. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Mpo, very much for the presentation. Uh, I have to confess that I'm also from the very skeptical about uh, this uh, grant. Uh, I, I, I believe that the, they really do turn citizens into uh, depend into uh, dependency to, to the state. But your presentation has actually opened my eyes, uh, made me like try to get out of my shell and look at the broader uh, picture uh, with regards to this, because reality is that we have a high number of poverty and uh, we need to find ways of uh, eradicating that poverty. And we cannot always re, uh, rely on people getting employment since South Africa itself is not able to uh, create employment for everyone uh, uh, who, who, who needs who needs it. But uh, I do have, uh, I don't know if I can say it's questions or comments, but it was just my observation. Uh, if, if I'm out of order, please uh, put, pull me back. 
uh, I was, as you were, as you were making the presentation, I was just trying to look into all the aspects that uh, make us as South Africa. And when we talk about uh, the poverty versus the unemployment and all that, uh, somebody once said, uh, it was, it's actually an ex-colleague who once said that in South Africa, we have created a system wherein uh, the, we, we, we all want a piece of a pie. Like it's our system is sort of a pie and everybody wants a piece. And unfortunately the pie is so small that not everybody will be able to, to get a piece thereof. And given that, I actually believed in that and it made me make, make, make like it made, it made me, I, I thought about it as we, we were talking about, as you, you were presenting. Uh, the, our pie is very small. When we talk about pie here, uh, we talk about, yeah, the ability to employ all or ability for all to, for all those who want to, to create their own businesses, uh, to, to, to have businesses. Because even if all of us can want to be like 50% of those who want to have businesses, will not be able to compete equally. And those who are in the market who wants to be employed might not be all employed because of the size of our pie. And you, 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 you also mentioned that uh, we, can we can assist in 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 like one of the one of the ideas is to raise taxes and if if i know very well is that tax uh, the highest income tax is at a 45% and if we were to increase it where would we go like really and now Sorry, sorry. I'm just taking. I'm just trying to go through my news. I was writing very fast, so I seem to be out of out of order here. But uh, what I want to say basically is that our system is overloaded, and we did try to create uh, grants. For example, Noctula talked about the the child support grant which were created. I think they were created with good intentions. They were also trying to alleviate poverty, given the history of how uh, our parents raised their children and our grandparents raised their children. They came with, an, they came with good intentions. But the unintended consequence of that was that now people started to use it as a money-making scheme. Hence, we will see situation wherein we have young children giving birth, knowing that they would get the income, the income, the social, the child support grant. So, how do we how do we make sure that we manage this kind of a situation? Even if we were to give everybody the basic income grant, as 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 uh, in as it's proposed, how are we going to make sure that? it does what it, what, what it's intended to, because so far what we have seen within our communities, as much as on paper it might look, uh, it might, it might uh, identify few people who, who are success stories, but the reality is what we see within our communities is that those people who get those 350s, some will wait, will, will not even go every month to collect it. They know that if, if they skip a month, next month when they go, they will get 700 rand. With the 700 rand when they have it, they will just go and it's a weekend of party and enjoyment or they're going to buy nice sneakers or nice clothes or whatever. You'll find that it doesn't serve the purpose as it was intended to do so. So what I want, what, what my, my, my view is, what I think needs to be done first uh, before maybe we can be to a state, to a point as a country wherein we're saying, let's take care of the, those who are underprivileged. Let's start and fix ourselves as a country first. Uh, as, our, as, as, as South Africa itself, we know that we don't have enough money for anything. We, we, we like almost everything that we are doing, we are doing it uh, by, 
holding on a thread because uh, so many things have affected our fiscals negatively and uh, we, we are just struggling. So let us fix our coffers first as a country, make sure that we are sustainable self. We have our, we can, we can, we, our economy is sustainable. We are able to have enough people uh, who, 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 who can be employed. We are able to have enough people whom we can support, build their own businesses. And after that, we will be able to say, let's look at those who are unable to. We can do that because the situation of grants, government has tried. It's social, it's social, it's it's child support grant. Uh, the elderly, I wouldn't talk much about it because I believe that uh, uh, it's able to assist their families. But we have situations where in government has created bursaries for, for, for students. You'll find that there's in every year there's an intake of nurses. You'll, take, you'll hear that uh, government has taken 500 nurses, for example, to, to university to study nursing, social workers to study social work and all that. In the end, we still have a problem where in those nurses when they graduate, uh, when they graduate and social workers, they will still come and match to the government. We had a situation where in, uh, I think it was last year or year before, where in nurses here in Limpopo were, were, were matching at the Department of Health, crying to the MEC that, You've taken us to the university to study nursing. Now you are not employing us. That for me, I interpreted it as a, as a, as a, a gap within the system because even if we have given them this grant, it's also a form of grant by giving them buzzers to study for everything, but still, they still found it to not be effective to them, even though they have qualification in their hands. We have a situation I had on the news uh, during the week where in Texas, in I'm not sure if it was Vembe or, or Mopani, where in Texas were stopping the roads saying, forcing the bus company to increase their fares. Government was, uh, is, uh, I, I understand that government is, uh, is is giving the bus companies grant so that it helps those under, who are under privileges to be able to travel from one place to another, either to the job site or whatever. But there has been an external force that says, no, but the grant that you are giving uh, these people is also giving us a disadvantage because now people are now using buses to travel as opposed to taxis. So we need to create a system. I'm giving these examples as, as I'm trying to say, we need to be able to create a system wherein we are in control of our economy first. We know that we tick the first boxes, then we can say, let's look after those who are unable because now we are comfortable enough that we will have as many people uh, uh, employed where they need to be employed. We'll have many people uh, run their businesses sustainably so and employ other people. And then those who fall outside those brackets can be able to be taken care of. We can look, find ways of taking care of, of, of those. So yeah, in a nutshell, my stance is that let's take care of the bigger picture first before we go and look into the others. Because right now where we are as a country, we are unable to sustain our economy. So to, to add grants on top of that, it's just another strain that we are going to put in the already struggling economy. Uh, thank you very much. I feel like- No, 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 thank you so much. The thank idea you. is to discuss, it's not to listen to one person, so it's fine. Uh, Mpo, before you respond, there's another hand, the last one, I guess, uh, then we'll take another last round after that. Tembisile. Uh, there are people from Cape Town, KZN, Jovex, <laughs> they may not be familiar, <laughs> they may not be familiar with. Um, I apologize, I apologize. <laughs> uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I sure, I feel like I'm, I'm stuck in between of whether to agree with the G I B na or G B I B I G and B I G. Okay, 
oh my word, or oh, to disagree. But I, I feel that like, uh, here, sure. like our government, ne? a lot of things that I'm listening now, even as who system was talking and I'm like, yo, a lot of things that she's saying I'm agreeing with. I think our system fails when it comes to communicating with each other. Like every entity, it's standing on its own. It does not communicate with the other entity. Hence, we will always be a bit skeptical when it comes to certain things. Say for, a, for example, I, I remember I watch a lot of TV. So the other time I was watching TV and I saw that in America, in one of the states, that the minute you are registered as, as a father of a child, like your money lead every month gets garnished. Like you, you, whether you approve or you don't approve, but your money at the end of the month, it gets garnished for you to support the child that you have because the systems are communicating with each other. So I feel that here in South Africa, every, every entity, every system is on its own. So once we can fix that, I feel that once we fix the administrative part of it, then it would be easy for other things to fall into place. But currently I feel that we are just, we are trying to deal with the symptoms and not the actual cause of the, of, of that makes the symptoms to be there. So if we can fix that, let everything communicate with each other. Same as, for example, that you'll find that someone has applied for a job and they don't have the qualifications. And you'd ask yourself that, why is it that this thing was not picked up when per se the background check was being done? Meaning that our systems are not talking to each other. Our systems are not, they are not flowing. There's a cut somewhere along our systems that makes everything, every idea that we try and implement to have it to sort of like hit a, a brick wall. So nothing ever really penetrates because the systems are just not talking to each other. So they definitely will, that will definitely prevent for there to be progress in everything that we try to implement. Even like now we are even saying that, no, but how are we gonna know that the people that are gonna be getting the money are the people that are not working, are the people who are, who are not like this and that. It is because we are already corrupt. Like our system is already corrupt. The people maybe that we have put in position that they should do this, they themselves have said, okay, no, the pie is not big enough for everybody. Let me get my cut now. And the, the support that is supposed to flow to the people, it is, not, it is not flowing because even like the people that we have put in our in positions have sort of like taken the, the subsidy that is supposed to reach the people. Hence, we'll even say that, no, we don't trust people will do that. But the people who have shown us, like say maybe for our political people, some of them have shown us that, yes, we've put them in power, but they still rob us when we've put them in power. So how about we give it to that person who's not working, who's there that we don't know, and let's see what they will do. Because the ones that we've trusted, we've put in position, they are not really implementing and they just want to take for themselves. I mean, like corruption, they've robbed us like millions now. I was even reading the other day that Zuma wants us to help him with money for the lawyers. I mean, you've, you've robbed us of a lot of money and now you still want to come back to us and be like, help me out guys. So like all of that, I think once we fix our system, like let them talk to each other. When you go to home affairs, let your whole history be there everything that is connected to you, let it reflect. In Azoba and Togut, you go to home affairs, then they'll tell you that, no, you need to go to the police to do an avid that you don't have any cases against you. Why is it that it's not showing in the system already? Then I need to go from that post to that post, to that office, to that office. But if everything was talking to each other, then that will make the implementation of a lot of things very easy. So thank you. I'm going to stop there now. Wow.
<laughs> Over to you, Mbo. <laughs> I'm blown. My pages are getting full. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't, you know what? Um, this is why I love these conversations because we can, we can talk and yeah, I think, yeah, we can talk and I'm, I'm also learning from what you guys are saying, but about, I want to answer about that we need to, to fix our system. I think we need to acknowledge that we, the, low, the, the democratically elected government of South Africa post 94, from 94, they inherited an already fragmented system. And so what that means is that the issues that we are facing today are issues that were designed years ago. So it's gonna be very difficult to, to solve problems. And hence I said that a BIG is not a silver bullet to all problems because that is not the truth. Our problems, go far deeper. We are dealing with structural inequality. We are dealing with structural unemployment. And that is why we're gonna keep seeing what we're seeing. We're gonna keep seeing the visuals from you know, July. If people are not, if people feel like they are being excluded from you know, the system. And yes, I agree with you, Mam Dimko, that we all want a piece of the pie. And I always, there's, a, there's always a running conversation in the house that, you know, I hate corruption with all my life and I hate it when it comes from people in power, people that have been entrusted with managing public funds. But then I can also understand why some of them do it. And I say some of them because we are dealing with people that never had. And once you are in power and you have, you are going to want to protect for yourself. Yes, there are those people that you feel like now it's, you, you're being greedy there's no reason for you to take this much money and this situation why are you stealing public funds during a crisis people need you know schools need to be fumigated people need to eat and yet you're stealing money and that is what we have been most people have been saying to say if you reduce you know if you prevent corruption from happening if you recoup the money that has been corrupted we're speaking about billions here you know we're speaking about a lot of money that if you reduce that then we can rather use that money for something that will do good for the economy, the money that will come back into the economy. But you just keep taking, keep taking, you keep taking, but you're not providing for your people. So now you're increasing the gap of inequality that we're going to see more and more people getting rich and we're going to see more and more people getting poor. And that will never, will never be stable. And we'll, we'll never see you know, economic stability. We'll never see social stability. We're going to keep having issues. So I just want to say that we we inherited a very fragmented system, and you know I think like we that's going to be have to be another topic for another day, uh, and how you know we have to deal with the structural inequalities and, and the poverty that comes with and everything else. But you know, Sister Tembi, you said that we need to educate people about you know managing finances. I absolutely agree with you, and I feel like those educations or that you know knowledge will be beneficial if people have the money in hand right now we can't tell people how to spend money that they don't have once we can get to a position where people have that money then we can have the message will land you know then the message will it's practical because people can apply it to their practicality. It's like the topic about saving when, when we have conversations about we need to save, even if it's a hundred rands a, a month, you need to save to teach yourself that strength. But it's just like, how do I save when I have zero income? You know? So yes, about um, the, Mr. Macheta spoke about you know, the, the, the registration process and the qualifying process and who would get it and if whether or not, you know, the, the EPW, the programs that are already in place. What we are saying is that right now, we are working to implement a system that will not force people to prove how poor they are, to prove how much money they need. You know, by virtue of being unemployed, it comes from a point of saying, we understand what we are dealing with, we understand the gaps and we understand the stigma of being poor. And that is why I think most CSOs are shying away from conditions because we don't want to now say, well, because you're poor, you are gonna clean the streets of Johannesburg because then that's 
like it goes back to what I said earlier that we're making people slaves because they are poor. The truth is they have a right. You know, government has a moral obligation to provide for those people. So why is it, why should a different standard be applied to them? You know, and about, and I think that speaks to the unintended consequence of the child support grants is that you, you're providing for the child support grant, but you're not providing a grant for the caregiver. So you are giving me as the mother of a child who cannot obviously keep that money for themselves. So I am the custodian, but you're giving me 400 grants to provide for my child. How am I gonna provide for my child when there's two of us? And so that's why I think it leads to the trap of having more kids with the thought that, okay, if I have two kids, then that's 800 grants, you know, it's more than the 400 grants, which is obviously not even you know, on the level of the food poverty line, which then is a problem because it's not sustainable. It's, you're gonna keep wanting to get more and more and more. So I think it's just having to look at our system and being honest with ourselves to say, hmm, maybe Uma Bule is spending this money on herself. And by the time she needs to spend it on Ube it's it's already finished. It's not enough. She's not receiving any assistance from the government. In fact, they were only included now with the SRD grants to say that caregivers can now, you know, also apply, which I think is amazing. It's a huge bonus. Apply it to them and let's also increase the child support grant. So it's, we're dealing with a lot of problems right now as a country. And the truth of the matter is a basic income grant will not solve all of those problems. It will not, you know, fix the problems that we are currently facing you know, I think it goes back to the system that is so fragmented that we can't blame people for wanting to, you know, use the money for other things to make it work. It's, that's why I think it's very important that maybe perhaps we start with a pilot, but before we can even get to the pilots, the piloting stage, in order for this to be a success, we need government support. The reason why the current grants are working to a certain extent is that it's because they have received the government support. If without the government support, then it's it turns everything. And I've seen how the conversations have turned recently with the release of the green paper, where government said, yes, we 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 acknowledge the system is wrong. We acknowledge that uh, you know people are excluded. We acknowledge all of that and we want to put a, a BIG hence, you know, they've suggested the 500 and you know, 85 with a 10 point, 10.10% increase in income tax. And also on the income tax, it's just, it's to say income tax is not, it's not, it's not what I think most advocates are going for because we understand that it's already a lot. People are already paying more than they should. That's not what we're going for. We're going for the other different kinds of taxes. It's not just one tax form that exists. And, you know, the fact that, sorry, I'm just all over right now because I feel like everything links, but the fact that someone would skip not getting the 350 this month instead of getting it after three months, that is very telling. Why is someone opting to let that money accumulate to an amount that is decent, to an amount that is over a thousand rands? It's because 350 is not enough to do anything. You cannot... You, you can't, I personally can't survive on 350. And I know everyone else can't survive on 350. Maybe we should actually challenge our ministers to say, use, use, use 350 and see if you can survive. Cause it's not enough. Use the 1.5, you know, the 1,268 and see if you can survive. It's not enough. But with the 1,208, we know that, okay, you know what, even if it's 50% of it will go back, you know, you will spend it at pick and pay or at Boxer or somewhere that little amount will come back to you. It's something, it's better than people not participating at all. Because then how are we going to solve problems? That's why we're gonna see, we're gonna keep seeing issues of protesting because people are hungry. And when an opportunity presents itself, they will take it. And so we can't really blame them. And I think it begs the question of who are the real looters? Are the people that we saw running to a Jablan mall that I saw, because I live in Jablan, and so I saw people going up and down. Are they the real looters, or is that a sign of the system that we are currently living in? So it's not, 
it's a very broad it's a very broad conversation and I think it speaks to a lot of things and I think the reason why it's so contentious is because it speaks to the very issues that we the government is struggling to address poverty and inequality and unemployment the government is not doing that we don't trust I agree with you Tim Sile, we don't trust government because of what they have done we have been robbed people are starving so it's you're enriching yourself, but your people are struggling. Which one, what's, what's happening? And did you saying there's no money? And now you're coming to us and saying, you want to create a national social security fund where everyone is going to contribute between eight and 12% of already what they're contributing to the UIF. What are you gonna do with the money? We don't trust you. You've looted money, you've looted billions. So it's like, we don't understand. Let us be in a position where we help people to help themselves. Giving a, a person, and this is why I hate food puzzles, because it's so dehumanizing. Yes, you're giving someone a food puzzle, but you're telling them that you don't know what's good for you. I will give you a puzzle with this stuff, with this stuff, because I know what's good for you. Even with, it's just not enough. And that's why some people have said, okay, well, instead of giving someone a grant, you know, how about you give them a, a boxer voucher that they can redeem at a boxer only? It's like, why do you want to tell people how to spend their money? If someone wants to pay for education, let them do it. If someone wants to use that money to, spend, to start a business, let them do it. And I think we can go on the whole day about whether or not a basic income grant is feasible. But what I can urge you is that when you have the time, and you have the means to do it. Please read the reports that have been made, made available. I can send um, the documents that I relied on to say, okay, this is to the documents that I relied on just to immerse yourself so that you can also create your own opinion and your own understanding. But it's, we have to look at it broadly. You know, we don't work in a, a BIG, it, it speaks to the bigger picture. It's part of the bigger picture and yeah, I mean, it's, I'm so passionate about this because I, I have seen, um, I've seen what a grant can do to people. I have seen that people are struggling. I have, you know, whether it be at home, whether it be at church, whether it be in varsity. And for me, it's just like, if this person had 1.2 right now, what would they do? And that would obviously make now, now we'd have to have a different conversation. If you see a boy who smokes in your bed, right now, if you had to ask that boy, why are you smoking? That probably tell you because I'm not good at it. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. But now if they had that money, and as the system we said, you have educated them on how to use money wisely, and you have also given them incentives to say, if you, you know, work with this, you may, you may get more, you know, consider going to school and finishing your matric, consider, you know, applying for a course, consider doing all of this, then you can have a conversation to say, with everything that's been done for you already, what is the problem? Because right now you can ask him what's the problem. He's going to tell you, I'm, I'm hungry. There's no money. Um, I've dropped out of school because, you know, there's no money at home. I have more kids because I think that, you know, I thought that maybe having more kids, I would get more money and then I will, you know, be able to support everyone. So it's a very, it's a very, it has a lot of parts to it. It's not, it's not a one you know, look at it from one perspective and it's it's going to get rid of all our problems. Even with the basic income grants, we're still going to have problems. Our government will still have to face the music. Our government will still have to account for their failures. Um, you know, schools are not the way they should be. The education is not the way it should be. Women are still unsafe in their homes, at work, in their streets. Violence is is huge and you know poverty related crimes exist and you know this is just a um, one solution in there is a step in the right direction and hopefully we can get to a point where government comes to parts and say okay we hear you and i think those are the people that we are really looking to you know to convince and it's 
I guess it's encouraging also to see the Department of Social Development to say, we are, we are with you and we support you. We just need to find a way of making it work. For me, it's to say, as long as people, those people are, are included in the system, as long as irrespective of the process or, you know, to say, okay, we're gonna, in, we're gonna introduce it in different stages or, you know, these people are gonna get first. For me, it's the effort to make things better because dealing with structural issues, it's, if we have to stop everything to deal with that, then we'll never get anywhere in our country. And it's just gonna be, it's not gonna be sustainable. So I, I hope I have answered everyone's questions. Um, and yeah, if needs be, I think we can have another, we can have another discussion another time. <laughs> yeah. No, we're definitely going to have another session. Wow. Um, you have actually made me look at this um, topic differently from today. Mm -hmm. And it will actually be appreciated if you can share those documents. And definitely, uh, if you're free in October, we can uh, create another slot for you because there's somebody who is also based in Zambia, but is a South African and is going to talk about how South Africa is closed up to alleviate poverty. They don't create situations where business people will be able to, um, you know, give the poor the poor people, um, you know, opportunities to to venture into their business ideas, if you want to call it that. And they, with him, he decided to go to Zambia, and Zambia welcomed him with both hands. And now he's like doing something that will make Zambia a hub an economic hub mm -hmm. of Africa of some sort. Mm -hmm. So you will be on our platform and we can, we'll be glad to have you back. You said something that really <laughs> hit the nerve. Um, you said we should not create a system that will require people to prove themselves that they are poor. Wow. You see, I, I had butterflies in my tummy when you were saying that. And I realize when you are working, you don't realize how, how much people who are not working suffer. If, the, if, if, if people who are working now, government, uh, government employees, for instance, are crying for the 1,600 which they are going to be given, just imagine how that 1,600 can do to a person who's not currently working um, to his life. Um, I think we've become selfish too. We have become inconsiderate we always look at the, including myself, having been against this uh, grant. Um, as much as there are gaps which need to be fixed, like the systems which are not uh, integrated, but at the same time, not being able to see that there's somebody who actually go to sleep without food on their table. And yesterday I saw on the news, a government employee was killed, cold blood. And when they get the hitman, it was said that they were given 450,000 each just to kill a person who has reported corruption. And that is out of poverty. You ask yourself how many people are hijacking cars, killing people just to have food on their table. So yeah. the profound statement that you said that if we alleviate poverty, we are giving people the buy buying power because they will be able to do things for themselves. And as much as we won't live in a happy country uh, or a very perfect country, but to a certain extent, people will be able to do things for themselves. Look, you have, uh, and people, let me say, this is my niece, by the way, that's why she was saying, Auntie Tembi, the beginning. <laughs> you, you have made me realize how much selfish I have become and inconsiderate. And I think it goes for everybody who might have been against. This is, a, I think, a homework for all of us to go and say, how can I make a difference in somebody's life? Um, mm. Look, government will not be able to do it on its own. That is a fact. And that True. is one of the, the reasons I created this platform, because I realized as a government employee working for an organization that is responsible for identifying ways to improve the systems of government, we are failing while I'm still inside government. And as a junior employee, though I'm at, at the management level, I still struggle to give my ideas that will be adopted within a government space. Um, so if we are able to create a system like 
we have this kind of engagement. There are people who work in the in the in the South African police, for instance. They, there are people who work in the municipalities, for instance. Some working in different sectors who will be able to say, this is how I can be able to, to assist. Uh, I created a TikTok for this platform. 300 and something people followed the, 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 the platform. And most of them are sending messages to say, wow, where can we get this video so that we can listen, we want to participate, we want to, um, you know, give inputs or also contribute towards, you know, making people become independent and be able to do their work. Let's fix the systems. That is one of the solutions identified. Okay, money management without money, that is not feasible. We just have to make them have money. Um, we should not create a system that will make people feel that they are poor. So if young people are not working currently, all of them are supposed to be given an opportunity to um, either get the, the, the BIG or they're given an opportunity for their business ideas to be funded, which currently is not uh, being done as expected. Um, wow. <laughs> I, I think I can go on and on and on and on. You actually challenged me beyond... Um, my imagination and thank you so very much i'm so proud of you and as a young person um she's not even 25 people and that means the country is in good hands i believe that we can be able to um engage with you better and and engage more is if there's anybody who's who's got anything to say in closing before we uh, we call it a day for today you are allowed to, but thank you so very much, Mpo. We, we really appreciate yeah. you so much. Anybody else? And thank you. I don't thank mind you for... it. Yes, yeah, the daughter in law. Bambi. Hey? I don't mind it. Yes, yeah, the daughter in law. <laughs> <laughs> I will charge you so much money. That, that will come in for free. <laughs> no, I don't mind. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank yeah. you so much. I'm, I'm so glad. I'm, I'm happy for this opportunity and I get really nervous around people. So I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that my message landed and the whole point was to really challenge everyone. And it's not to say, decide, make a mind up now, but it's to challenge everyone to say, let's, let's talk about it. What can, can we afford not to implement a BIG versus can we afford it, which yeah, but um, yeah, I'm I'm happy. I'm really happy for this platform, and I think you're doing amazing work on TV. I will follow that TikTok as well because I'm on TikTok as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I I in the absence of anything, if you can, like, can, can I add? Yes, the you are can, welcome. Can, okay. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Mpo for really opening up my eyes because this topic is something that I have always dismissed and I've always said, no, 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 we are creating people to be to not be self-sufficient by just giving them. But you, what, what you did, what I got out of this conversation was that it's, this issue is actually bigger than how it looks. Right now we are just looking at the surface and not really looking behind. So what you did, you've challenged me personally to actually look behind and broader at this subject and just to say, no, people are lazy, they're not, they don't want to work and they don't want, uh, so they want state to give them everything. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I will, I will definitely study this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are you still there, Tebuho? I think um, she, I think she yeah. She probably had a network problem. There's so much comments that are coming through. Um, I'm sure you might have read yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah, but for the record, um, somebody is saying that as much as there is corruption reported for from the government uh private sector and civil society and corporates need to rise to the occasion um yeah and then we're gonna have a session where we're gonna talk about systems and would appreciate if you can also be part of that 
Uh, this is a very good point. Um, yeah, and so forth. Some left and they, they have indicated that they would be watching. So as much as they may not have been as many people, actually this is quite enough. We, we, we usually target 10 people. And if we exceed that, then it, that is actually a bonus um, because most engagement would have like 10, 15 people from where I'm coming from. So our target will usually be 10. We have exceeded that. I think we're, we're going around 18 or 20, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I'm assuring you that this is going to be watched by so many on our YouTube. And uh, we'll we, we usually cut clips and post them on um, mm -hmm on what you call it on TikTok so that people can can be able to go and watch. So thank you so very much. We, we really appreciate you. Um, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, I think this is a big elephant that we're supposed to contribute towards. Um, we, we cannot say it is for Mpo. And I would appreciate if you can also share the presentation so that I can share with everybody. I'll also share with some of the people that uh, participated in the platform that two professors were requested every time we have engagement, I must actually share with them because they would want us to um, be linked with people who will assist us in, in getting assistance on gaps that we have identified in order to solve those problems. So uh, before we finalize the report that we're going to submit to different stakeholders will engage with you uh, so that you can also give inputs. But in the absence of any other comment, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, as indicated, I'm Tembegile Felicia Makubele, your host. Please miss that, meet us next time. We will publicize all the engagements and we're going to have a great time like we did today. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ompa, for joining. Bye. Bye. Thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank bye. you, and bye. Bye, Tembi. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Basani. Thank you, Tembi. Bye. Bye. Very informative and thought-provoking. Thank you so much, dear. Thank you. Bye. Keep Bye. well. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Macheta. Thank you, Tembi. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you for the support. I've got a crash behind me. Sorry for the background it's okay. noise. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> uh, all right. Sure. Bye. Mister, hey, you joined so late. <laughs> Mina, you are like putting me in the, in the situation of. <laughs> but today I didn't forget. I actually recorded on two um okay this one has got the full one and the other one has got half yeah. because it was still um you know loading but yeah it went very 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 well very well you can stop recording now.